to welcome uh, everybody. Um, as I said, a very uh, insightful afternoon. Um, it gives me great pleasure to actually host this panel. Uh, the topic of the panel is, is there too much hype with AI ops? And to talk about that particular topic, it gives me great pleasure in inviting four esteemed speakers. Um, Lawrence Liu from uh, at, uh, AI Singapore, Dr. Jing Yuan Zhao from Capgemini, Vidal Fernandez from CLP Holdings, and Lee Sarkin from Munich Re. So um, panelists, if we are online, uh, let's uh, get started. Um, I really want to open up with the basic question, um, if I may. And the fundamental question is, what is your definition of AI ops? Because that particular word has been bandied around way too long. And I think everybody's got a different perspective of it. So, Vidal, maybe I might start with you. What is your definition of AI ops? Well, I, I will say that the short definition is that AI ops is the artificial intelligence for IT operations. Um, uh, in order to be um, more, uh, or to have a more detailed definition, I would say that uh, AI ops is a multi layer technology platform uh, to operate, automate uh, everything related with artificial intelligence, big data platforms, um, uh, uh, machine learning uh, solutions uh, to make sure everything we have built based on the data and through this uh, artificial intelligence solution is adopted and is delivered in a, a more efficient manner to everyone in uh, the company. So AI ops facilitate the adoption of artificial intelligence and big data technologies. Awesome, thank you, Fidel. Um, I might throw up the same question just to another uh, industry for me. Lee Sarkin from insurance. Um, could you give your definition if you may? I'm just curious in terms of, this is a slight uh, angle to that from industry to industry. So Lee Sarkin, if you're online, if you could give your definition of AI ops, please. Sure, Cindy, and good afternoon to, to, to all the attendees. I, I think, um, you know, as Vidal said, basically it's it's a, you know, ML ops is the, the operations of machine learning. It's a, it's a set of standardized processes and tech capabilities for building, deploying, and operationalizing, you know, predictable machine learning models rapidly and reliably. Um, from an insurance perspective, you know, we're really talking about um, deploying and integrating those models into insurance business processes um, to ultimately generate the business value because, you know, without the actual implementation, there is no or limited uh, value. So it's, it's really the, the technology um, in terms of AI platforms, machine learning operations, um, that are going to productionize those models, um, you know, in, into actual system and, and business processes, really bringing the models to life and the whole uh, sort of cycle of um, operations and maintenance around that. Now that's great. And, and I, I can already see, you know, a different perspective from, from different. So Lawrence, um, again, you know, your view as AI Singapore, when, when, and you must be dabbing a lot in AI ops, what is your uh, definition of AI ops? Or how do you see it? I think the first two panelists covered very much the, the technical and engineering aspect of it. And I would like to bring in a different dimension. Um, I, I, you know, ultimately, the AI ops must deliver business value. So when we look at AI and the use of AI in, in whether it's in IT or business operations, the ultimate goal is it has to deliver business value, whether is it in terms of decreased cost, increased productivity, or new customers. So, um, in fact, that, that's how we evaluate all the AI, AI projects that we get. And the, the first question we ask is, you know, what's the ROI? Absolutely. I think that's that, that never goes away and everything is for a, a value to the business. So, Dr. Xingjuan, if, if I might bring you in, um, you know, what are kind of the key ingredients to have a successful AI initiative? I mean, from, coming from Capgemini, you received a lot of clients, you know, operating the space. What would you be your view on that topic? Yeah, I think just now uh, our panelists have uh, um, shared their views on the AI ops uh, definition. Definitely data is the uh, key component to enable the uh, AI applications, right? So then before we uh, go into the AI application development, 
we need to build a strong data platform because for the uh, IT operation, the data sources are very diverse and dynamic. So the data source is not only the um, uh, uh, historical data, the batch data, actually we need to analyze the real-time data. So whether we have a tool, we have technology to uh, uh, store, to ingest real-time and batch data is a key, right? This is an example. Also the data governance, how to build a trust data, right? This one will uh, make sure uh, that we can deliver reliable AI application. So I think this one is the first dimension we need to, uh, we need to uh, uh, take care. And the second dimension definitely is uh, uh, from the user case perspective. There are uh, multiple uh, user case. However, for each uh, unique organization, we need to identify your priority, your challenges in the IT operation. Also, before we start the AI application, we need to set up the clear KPI to measure the ROI as Lawrence mentioned, right? Otherwise, it's, uh, it's very difficult to achieve the long-term success. And uh, uh, the uh, third dimension I want to mention is about uh, uh, the uh, culture change. Because uh, now uh, we observe in the organization, uh, some organization have started AI ops uh, development. However, the data science team, the AI expert, is still disconnected with the uh, with, uh, uh, IT operation team, means they are doing their separate job. This one is a uh, make a difficulty for this uh, development, also the adoption. So we want to see the mix of uh, uh, AI profession and the IT professions working together, means uh, we want to see someday the IT profession can use a Jupyter notebook to do some uh, uh, insight, to uh, generate some insight, to use insight. Also for our data scientists, it's not only focused on the accuracy, also to go through the IT operation process to make the, uh, the uh, uh, solution and insight can be applied or can enable uh, uh, action. So I think these are the uh, three dimensions I want to uh, highlight for the uh, for the AI uh, ops. No worries. Thank you. That, that's that's very insightful. So I'm going to move to Videl. Um, you know, CLP Holdings, a lot of uh, different assets in your uh, in, in, a, in a conglomerate. Um, what what are your lessons from your industry? And when I talk about industry generally, you know, you've got utilities, you've got other other businesses as well. Mm -hmm. So Videl. Um, from from Videl, your perspective, what are you, what are you seeing? Uh, what, what are you seeing the key vessel? So the question, uh, and Dr. Jing Yang, is actually for Mr. Videl Fernandez. So, uh, Videl, can you talk about that from a CLP perspective, please? Uh, from CLP perspective, is is basically we are an utility company, a power utility company, and one of the biggest challenges we have is uh, probably we are one of the more most intensive uh, companies and industries that are using real-time data. So for more uh, of the IoT systems we have, and um, also the internal system, we collect uh, a, a very high speed and, and, and high velocity and a huge amount of data. So this is always very challenging. For you to give you an example, uh, uh, some of the systems are collecting more than 10,000 data points per second. So this is one of the big challenges we have in the industrial um, uh, sector, uh, in the specifically in the power utility companies. Uh, so it requires that to have a very uh, robust uh, infrastructure, technology infrastructure, to make sure we can collect the data uh, real time and also near real time in most of the systems collecting from the internal system and IoT devices, sometimes remotely uh, located. And we have to make sure we collect the data with the uh, quality and timely, readable, and ready for the business operation. This is one of the big challenges uh, for sure. But uh, something that uh, I would say that is common for every company, including our, our company, is the, is the people change. So, uh, it requires sometimes uh, do things in a different manner, including IT. In, in terms of IT operations, 
uh, this, this is something that is challenging a lot, the way we work and the way we operate. So uh, I think is, is people changing is some of the things and the critical factors for the successful um, AI operations, right? I think uh, that's great. Uh, thank you, Mr. I think, you know, utilities, the real-time generation, high volume of data, I guess I can sort of see a parallel in the telecommunication industry, which I'm very familiar with as well. So, you know, the amount of uh, velocity and the, and the volume that's been generated. Um, Lee Sarkin, from insurance, I mean, you know, yes, you, you generate a lot of data, but nowhere even close to, I would say, real time that, you know, that Fidel's facing or, or folks in the telco industry. What are your kind of perspectives from the insurance, uh, you know, what challenges or lessons you can kind of learn? Sure. I, I think firstly, um, I mean, Minicry has been one, I think, of the few financial service companies in Asia to, to actually productionize predictive models for real-time scoring at a point of sale for, for what we call underwriting. Um, that's the process of assessing a customer's risk at the sales stage. And so our AI models are really looking at, you know, bringing various uh, automation, other value at the point of sale. And so you are talking about real-time scoring, even though it's not that um, volume of, of features in a model. Um, it's certainly data that's extremely complex to understand from a domain perspective. So, I mean, some of the key ingredients, you know, to, in terms of a successful uh, MLOps initiative between business and tech would be understanding the business process in which your models have to be implemented and in which your tech needs to enable the model. Uh, specifically the system environments of insurers, which historically have had a lot of legacy issues uh, so just understanding how the model should be integrated in a business process, firstly, and secondly, in a system uh, landscape is, is the second, uh, and then building on appropriate integrations. Um, I mean, typically in, in our space, um, you know, you, you need to have um, a, a close alignment of business requirements with, um, with, with technology architecture design if you're building a platform. So I'd say that's a key ingredient. You need to start with appropriate business requirements. And, and understanding the business context in which the model will be deployed. And potentially you may face certain software um, you know, upgrades to even enable predictive model deployment. Uh, so it really depends on the insurer and what business problem you're solving and hence the systems from which the data is coming from and that models have to be integrated with. But certainly in the underwriting space, this is really essential because um, you know, that's where risk is created for insurers. So, um, and, and models are doing real-time decisioning. So that's, uh, that's really, really essential you understand uh, the business process. I think, it's a, thank you, uh, it's a very different perspective. I mean, I think the challenges Bedell spoke to, so some of the challenges you're facing, I mean, they're, they're very important, but again, a very different perspective. So, uh, Lawrence, from AI Singapore, right, uh, what are the, I mean, what are you seeing in terms of some of the lessons, in terms of the experience that you, know, you might have gone through in AI ops, and what are you seeing that you can share with the audience as well? Uh, yeah, so I was just responding to a question uh, posted by one of the audience, and and, and the question asked whether you know the the uh, does AI ops leads to you know in, uh, decrease in in headcount and so on. So in one of the projects that we did for a German MNC uh, about two, two years back, uh, where we helped implement AI into the IT operations, um, it did not lead to any increase or decrease in staff. But what it, it led to was was the ability for the support staff to uh, have the AI system actually handle a lot of the very uh, standard, very mundane uh, IT support tickets automatically, and thereby freeing them to focus on the really critical systems that, that really need human attention. So uh, it led to a you know, much better outcome uh, uh, in terms of custom support. And uh, obviously from the IT support side, uh, it allowed them to focus on the really difficult problems rather than the very mundane, very boring, typical standard uh, IT support uh, requests. So I think um, you know, the use of AI in, in, in IT operations brings about you know, uh, tremendous value. And I highly encourage everyone to really look at how AI machine learning can help automate a lot of this, this tasks and processes. And I think thank you for responding to the question. And um, my uh, encouragement to all the participants, I can see there's about 85 on, on the call. Please, uh, you know, put in your Q&A into the, the chat box because these panelists are experts who can actually answer that and we'll come to a bit of a Q&A as well. 
I think, thank you for that, uh, Lawrence. I, I think this this notion of AI ops, it, it comes back to me in memory of when people used to deal with operations technology in the industry and then IT came in and then the amalgamation of the two. I think we're in that sort of phase of, you have the traditional IT operations, you've got this AI operations, and then I, in fact, Lee Sarkin's uh, you know, comment about how do you do this predictive model deployment? How do you actually operate it? What does that mean? And then to your point about how do you really enable IT ops to actually go to the next value step or using the capabilities here? That's, that's great, thank you for that. So Dr. Shingwan, the question for you, if you may, in a very brief manner, what are the kind of the one, one or two lessons that, that you, know, you wanna share with the audience on AI ops? Yeah, thank you. Uh, just now, um, Lawrence and uh, uh, we do and uh, also uh, uh, the panelists uh, share from the industry, right, from the different industry, the learnings. Uh, from my side, uh, we are working with uh, uh, multiple uh, industry clients. So I want to share some uh, uh, common problems and lessons. So the first one is uh, when the uh, data scientists build the AI model, right, is uh, uh, when we uh, focus on the accuracy, then maybe your algorithm will be a black box or cannot be explained. So this one is a, is a raise a barrier to the to the user. For the IT team, they really need to understand what happened, what logic, and what kind of uh, uh, key features, important feature to draw this issue. Then based on that, they can make a better decision. Without uh, uh, transparency, for them is uh, is uh, very difficult to adopt. So uh, how to build uh, uh, explainable AI? This is uh, something we need to consider. And the second learning uh, uh, also, when we build the model, right? Uh, it's not a one-time job. Actually, they need a, a continuous monitoring system to monitor the performance, also to uh, uh, check the data model drift. So I think for uh, a lot of organizations, they are missing this part. For the uh, uh, AI ops, the data, also the Python are very dynamic. We couldn't say, oh, this model is uh, perfect and can use forever. So we need to have this uh, monitoring system to help us to uh, uh, achieve the better uh, outcome. That's great, thank you. I'm, I'm gonna jump into some of the questions and I might throw this to uh, uh, Lee Sarkin if I may. One of the questions is, AI ops uh, you know, lead to companies overlooking important outliers because of an over-dependence of AI models that learn from historical data. I mean, this is a classic, I call it the statistical problem, right? It's not a technology problem, it's statistical. So, so Lee Sarkin, what is your view on that? Sure, Cindy. I mean, I think firstly, it's 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 not a new problem uh, for, for insurers, right? From an actuarial perspective, um, I mean, actuaries have been doing effectively analytics for a long time, learning from historical data and informing um, understanding of complex future events, right? So it's, it's, it's not new. And um, what I would say is new is really the, the the pace and automation at which predictive models need to be monitored. So I think having, you know, back to our topic of ML ops, I mean, firstly, having the technology to monitor model performance in real time through appropriate dashboards and visualization is one. Um, then having people that can interpret those trends. And then there's the whole question in the ML ops workflow of how do you store the data from production for retraining your models? And can you retrain in an agile way? Because you know, in insurance, this is a big topic. Um, the false positive errors for models can cost insurers a lot in their future claims with this error. And so you know, the need to actually monitor that performance and then be able to correct it if there's drift in the performance um, through, through storage of data and pipelines of data is fundamental. So you can't really do agile retraining without ML ops. I think that's, that's one of the key lessons. And this is so important because um, business processes adapt and predictive models have to adapt to those. So if you can't retrain in an agile way, you face the, the performance drifting and hence financial implications down the line for insurers. I think that's that's very important insight, Elise. Thank you for that. And one of the other questions that uh, is also coming up on the, the Q&A uh, panel is, you know, AI ops, I think maybe Lawrence, you touched upon this, um, is, you know, it's meant to augment existing human workforce. I think there was a query regarding the services industry you know, if we truly had AI ops, you know, would there be an impact on uh, human headcount and uh, the human touch, you mean, not the headcount, the human touch. I think you touched upon this a, a, as an augment, you know, rather than adding more value, rather than sort of impacting that human touch. Would you want to add any more comments on that? 
Yeah, so on, on that question, right, whether, you know, using AI ops will, will reduce that, that human touch. Um, uh, so, so my answer to that was, it is yes and no. There are times when you actually want a human to be involved, and there are times when you do not want. And, you know, going back to, to, to um, Ali's uh, uh, insurance example, for example, we, we implemented uh, AI in, into uh, insurance uh, claims pipeline, and if you are the one making the claim, you want your claim to be approved immediately. Do you want a human to look at it for, 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 for three days or, or one week or three weeks? No. So um, we, we implemented it uh, straight through processing for them. And if the claim is, is okay at a certain you know, confidence level, uh, the, the, the claims will go through and, and the person will get his uh, uh, money nearly immediately. But if there is any issue, then a human uh, will be alerted to, to take a look at it. And that's where the human then may reach out to, to you uh, or to the person to, to, to uh, uh, see what's, what's really uh, the issue. So I think you know, that the use of AI uh, uh, can enhance the experience. Uh, it has to be designed correctly. Uh, it's all about designing the, the user experience uh, in, in interacting with our AI systems. I mean, I think you know, the first generation of chatbots that, that we see were, were terrible, right? And uh, people, you know, just refuse to use chatbots after a while. But uh, I, I think it's getting better now. People figure out what was the best user experience and how to interact with them. So I think you get better with time. I'm, I'm going to throw. Thank you for that, uh, Lawrence. Uh, so, Vidal, um, one of the questions is success stories about AI, right? And in, in CLP Holdings, um, what what would be one key message you want to share with the audience in terms of you know whether it's success or or what I call Failure. Failure is not a bad thing until you learn from it. It's actually pretty powerful on your road to success. So it's not a bad thing, you know, especially in, in today's age of agile mindsets and, and so on. So what would be your perspective, Fidel? On, on... Yeah, I, I think to be honest, uh, uh, as every change in, 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 in the companies, in technology, in the way we operate, in the way we work, uh, it's not expected to have a big uh, success uh, that changed dramatically the results of the company or the performance of the company, right? It's more uh, something that is happening in a very small scale. So when you apply artificial intelligence data to the business decision and operations, what you can see is in, in the short term, maybe in one year or even less than one year, you can see uh, small improvements in everything you do in your business processes that individually probably are not very important, but in, in, in putting together after one year working efficiently in artificial intelligence and, and after one year or one year and a half or two years adopting artificial intelligence in the company, you can see a very clear difference in terms of efficiency, in terms of a business performance. So uh, we have to make sure, uh, we have to uh, fix the expectation of the companies that are uh, now in the decision process of adopting artificial intelligence. We cannot expect uh, something uh, very, very quick uh, and, and very uh, huge uh, success as a conclusion of implementation artificial intelligence, but when you adapt artificial intelligence in the business processes across the values chain of the company, uh, in, in, a, in a short time, one or two years, you can see that the company performance is completely different. Uh, more reliable in our case, so we, we have, we know, we, we, we have now a better customer experience, we are more reliable thanks to uh, uh, our operation are more efficient and uh, our customers are uh, more satisfied because we serve better and also we provide new services based on the data. So this is a, 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 a long run, uh, but it is not expected to have a, a dramatic success when you put in practice one of the models or one of the application of artificial intelligence. But uh, that means uh, the company's expectation has to be fixed, but uh, this is something that is going to happen in one or two years, if you do well in terms of the implementation and adoption. 
I think it's great. So the message is, is I mean, it is an iterative process, you know, and you've got to set the right expectations because it's it's an evolving process, right? It's not a one shot magic that's going to radically change something overnight. I think that's that's, that's a fair, fair comment. I think I'm going to pull in Lee Clark into this question that's in the in the Q and A uh, chat um, because you're a multi geography or multinational, and one of the questions was this impact of data residency, data sovereignty, of actually moving you know, uh, models across geo. So using the same model across geos because you've got the challenge of the data sovereign data residency. How is Munich retweeting that? I mean, there's a question from the audience. Sure. I think certainly data jurisdiction is a, is, is an important topic um, from a regulatory perspective and also from a company, uh, you know, comfort level um, in terms of what data can leave the company and the country. Um, many of our implementations, you know, we've been able to, to access across border data from, from our regional hub in Singapore. Uh, so it's not been an issue yet, but certainly certain of our markets um, across Asia, you know, going, going east in, in Asia uh, may be more sensitive. So I think this, this is very much a dynamic issue uh, where regulations are fast changing. And I think that from an ML ops perspective, the question is, um, how does a data scientist, uh, a data science team be agile in spinning up cloud-based environments for development of models on the fly, um, you know, as, as markets have these data jurisdiction issues. So that is a cost implication, but a, a technology roadmap, uh, it's really a design question of how you build, um, you know, to be able to spin up data science virtual machines as, as required. If I may just add to um, the previous point about some of the success cases that Vidal mentioned, I fully agree. I mean, you need to have an incremental approach. However, there are some big wins as well around uh, automation and straight through processing of, um, of, of sales and underwriting applications and insurance. So we certainly have been able to double or treble STP rates for certain life and health insurers. Um, but that obviously depends on the base at which they're starting. Um, but I think it's a much more sustainable expectation to have incremental um, you know, impact. Thank you. So we're nearly on time. We've got about three minutes left. And what I want to do is um, I do want to wrap and, and, and see if there's any interesting questions. But if I want to go around the panel and, and I would say the 20 seconds or less, you know, one key message that you want the panel, that the audience to take away. So uh, Lawrence, starting with you, what is the you know, 30 seconds or less? What's that one key message you want to leave with the audience? Um, you need to take a pulse of, of your organizations and your departments where they are in terms of AI maturity. And once you know that, then you can start to implement very specific interventions to move them from what we call AI unaware to AI aware and then to AI ready. Okay, that, awesome. Thank you, Lawrence. That's, that's very, that'll, that'll stick. That's a very good message. Thank you very much. So Dr. Ching Yuan, to you, 30 seconds or less, what is the one message you want to leave with the audience? You might be on mute. Yeah. So uh, actually from my side, I recommend the uh, user-centric uh, AI ops. So uh, let's uh, uh, think about uh, uh, our uh, AI application in uh, personalization, right? We understand the customer. We do a lot of uh, customer journey research. So also for the AI ops, right? Our user is the IT team. So we need to understand their, their purpose. Their, uh, how to fit their purpose and solve their problem. So uh, we need to do a lot of uh, reverse engineer to think about the design and the infrastructure. Great, thank you, thank you, that's fantastic. Uh, Vidal, to you, 30 seconds or less, one message. Yeah, I, I think artificial intelligence is a great opportunity to maintain and increase the competitive advantage in the market. So it's a necessity in, in, for the companies now. Uh, two uh, recommendations, I will say. Uh, technology is done, so technology is mature. Don't, don't, don't pay a lot of attention to technology. This is probably the third step you have to, 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 to be forward. But the first step is think about uh, the value added in your company and think about the people in the company. So uh, this is the first step. Strategy, people, and then technology. But uh, don't... Uh, change the order, I think is critical for the success. Thank you. Lee Sarkin, the final word, please. I think just to echo that, I think the time for, for investments in the, in the right type of AI analytics teams and the supporting AI tech is now. 
uh, and, and really to, to sustainably and reliably generate business value, we need to operationalize. So we need to start preparing AI ops for, for that. And I think the final point for me would be on risk. And um, we need to understand the future implications from deploying AI models, what they're going to be for, for our organization's profitability and, and also unintended consequence on our end user and customers. So I think we need to start moving to a phase of uh, the what if and, and what, what will be the impact in production of models on society at large and then hopefully uh, use AI and tech for, for good. Fantastic. I really want to thank all four panelists. I mean, I've learned a lot from a very insightful conversation. I do want to thank the panelists for their time taking up for a busy schedule, but I, I want to talk to the participants for raising all the questions. We will come back to some of those questions which haven't been answered, but uh, I just want to wrap up by saying very insightful conversation. Thank you panelists and uh, have a great day.